Krishna, 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 Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Hari, Hari Hari, Hari Hari, Hari such a effulgent crowd today. Wow. So many devotees and most of them are smiling. Not everybody, but we'll work on that. <laughs> okay. So we're moving towards a very auspicious occasion of the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Ramachandra. So the request was to center the discussion on that topic. And so we chose one particular pastime which is very instructive. Omagyan timirandasya ganajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurvena maha namam vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Mm. 
So, in the uh, narration about the activities of the Lord in his appearance as the Supreme Personality of Godhead Ramchandra, one of the outstanding uh, principles in that narration is that there are so many strong, powerful spiritual messages, both practical, moral, and spiritual messages, that we can learn from this particular narration. Which means these things can be applied in our own practice of Krishna consciousness to uplift our consciousness to a higher state of realization. And one particular pastime is quite outstanding. It's one of the pastimes by which uh, many of the commentaries or commentators on, on the Ramayana have mentioned that there's some criticism that's centered around Lord Ramachandra's activities. Although he is the Supreme Lord, and although his activities are always beneficial and pure, of course, many times people don't understand. And to understand the Supreme Lord is, is actually the principle of knowledge to try to understand the Lord more and more, but no one can understand the Lord completely. But we get some insight of why he does what he does and how he relates to his devotees, how he relates to the material energy. So one particular pastime in that, for those of you who are familiar with the Ramayana, but those of you who are not so much familiar, it centers around that when the Lord came, um, he had a mission, and that was to bring about Dharma in the world. Of course, yada yada dharma sya jnana bhavati bharata. Bhagavad Gita explains one of the reasons why the Lord appears is to reestablish real religious principles, destroy uh, what we say sub-religious principles or those religious principles that are taken as religious principles but are not, and at the same time destroy irreligion also. And he's teaching, especially in his incarnation as Ram, character. Character. What is your character? There's so many things we do, but what we do is less important than who we are. <laughs> of course, what you do is an extension of your character. But character is the basis of life, or it's the basis of our progress in any aspect of life, both material and spiritual. And character is so important because it really establishes one's position in relationship to everything in a proper way. And so Lord Ramachandra taught ideal character. If you compare him with the other incarnations of the Lord, especially when Sri Krishna comes, Krishna doesn't follow the standard Dharma because he is above all of that. <laughs> and he's acting as the Supreme Lord in all cases. And so sometimes he does things which are, from a material perspective, immoral. But they're not. <laughs> They just look like that. And just like for he marries 16,000 wives. So that looks quite immoral. <laughs> but for God it's not because God is the source of all existence and everything is his energy anyway. So he's never separated from anything. Or he says when he's on the battlefield of Kudushetra, he says, I'm not going to fight. But then the situation comes and he fights. <laughs> so we have this apparent, apparent, I use the word with some emphasis, apparent contradiction in his character in following Dharma. Truthfulness and what we say, chastity, are somewhat stretched in their definition with Krishna. 
but not with Ram. <laughs> Ram's different. <laughs> He's called Mayada Purusha, Purushottam. It means that he is ideal in every aspect of life. And he, almost, he acts like the perfect human being. But he is God, of course. And in his acting, he's teaching. What is the standard of morality, civility, spirituality, everything. Just like it's, he says, uh, when he was asked to be approached by one other lady, he was already married. And God usually doesn't turn down these approaches, but in this particular case he did. He said, Ekapatni, only one wife in this incarnation. And he taught the principles of an ideal king, how to rule according to the law books of mankind and according to the principles of proper governance based on material and spiritual principles. Everything was ideal in the character of Ram. When his father asked him to go to the forest and stay there for 14 years, although he was qualified and meant to take the throne, he immediately agreed. Obedience to superiors, one of the qualities of character. He did that. He listened to his father, although it appeared to be quite contrary to the situation. So that's, that's, that's Ram. He's ideal. He's righteous. If you're looking for a word to describe Lord Ram's character, he's personification of right, righteousness. Everything about him is what we say beyond reproach. No one can criticize. But then he is criticized for something he did that appears to be outside of the standard of proper Kshatriya codes. And I'll tell the story, <laughs> which will make up the whole class. And so, if you can just bear with me, it's a, quite of a long story. We all know at one point when he was in the forest, Sita was captured by Ravana. And now Ram is trying to find out where Sita is. He has no, apparently he has no clue. Acting in the role of a perfect human being, he doesn't know where Sita is. And so now he's trying to find out. He travels to the south. And while he's there in the forest, he meets one personality who approaches him in the disguise of a Brahmana. And that person is Hanuman. Hanuman came in the disguise of a Brahman to actually to come to meet Ram and get his darshan to uh, get the shelter of his lotus feet. Finally, after some discussion, Ram reveals why he's where he is. He came to the kingdom of the Varnas. The Varnas are the monkey soldiers that accompanied Ram in his battle. And there were millions of them, literally millions and millions, tens of millions of these monkeys. And they lived in one part of that area of the world that was divided into two sections, the north and the south. It was in the area of Kishkinda. And in that in the southern part, there were that was the area where most of the demoniac personalities inhabited. In the northern part were the saintly persons mostly. That's how it was divided. He came to the border of that place where the monkeys were camped out. And then he told his situation. My wife has been captured. I need help to find it. I was sent to the monkey soldiers uh, headed by Sugriva to get some support. He said, Hanuman said, well, I'm actually the minister, the chief minister under Sugriva. I will take you to Sugriva. So Sugriva was the powerful monkey king at the time. And then they made a pact, and it was an agreement. The monkeys were going to help. But then Sugriva real, uh, also said that I have one particular situation in my life that has become very difficult. Although I'm seen as the head of the monkeys, uh, of the, uh, I have been thrown out of that position by my brother, uh, 
Moses, Bali, brother of brothers, Bali. So Bali and Sugriva were brothers, close brothers. They did everything together. There was much love between them. Much everything about each other was done for the benefit of each other. They were so close. And Bali was the king of the, the monkey soldiers. And he uh, was there on the throne. Sugriva was his assistant, but practically they ruled together. So one day, one particular demon, very powerful demon, came into the courtyard where Bali and Sugriva was and challenged Bali to a fight. <laughs> and Bali immediately took up his club and weapons and responded to the demon. But Sugriva was thinking there might be more demons, so I should accompany my brother. So they both went. When the demon saw that, he realized he, he was defeated. Two of them. And he wasn't, so he ran to flee for his life. And, and Bali and Sugriva were chasing him. The demon found this cavern deep into the earth, and he, he crawled into this huge hole and disappeared. Bali stopped at the hole, turned to Sugriva, said, you stay here and you guard, just in case any other demons come. I'm going to take care of this demon. Okay? So he goes in, and Sugriva's waiting. And one day, things are very silent. There's nothing, no sound coming out of the cavern. Two days. Finally, on the third day, you hear a, a tremendous scream like a death, death-defying scream. And all of a sudden, it's silent. And then Sugriva is thinking, what's happening? He doesn't know. So he concludes, and he waits to see if Bali comes out, but Bali doesn't come out. So he's thinking, Bali must have been killed by the demon. So he made an assumption he judged without really understanding. But his judgment was based on everything that he could understand by his, the situation. So he concluded that Bali was killed, and now that demon was going to come out of the cavern. And so he took what he saw, this huge rock, and he rolled it in front of the hole to block the demon from getting out. And then he left and went back to the kingdom and told the other monkeys, our leader, Bali, has been killed. Everyone was very sad. There was a ceremony for mourning the death of Bali. And uh, then they said, well, Sugriva, since you are, you know, actually qualified and you are so close to Bali, you should actually be the leader now of the Varners. You should take the post. So Sugriva thought about it and he decided. Not that he was interested in it, but it seemed like he was the one to do the service. Sometimes we're asked to do service we don't like. <laughs> and But because it's necessity, there's no other option, no one else can do it, it needs to be done, we surrender. So he did. After some time, the situation was actually Bali killed the demon. But now Bali was in that cavern, and he, when he tried to get out, there was a big rock that was pushed in front of the hole. And he had been fighting with that demon for three days, so he was really exhausted. And so he tried to move the rock, and he couldn't. He was so tired, so he rested for some time. And then he was thinking, how is this rock getting, getting in front of this hole? No wind could possibly blow that rock and so he must, he concluded it must have been Sugriva to put the rock there. So he's struggling, straining, fighting. Finally his energy comes back and he moves the rock, he gets out. He goes back to the kingdom, he sees Sugriva sitting on the throne. His eyes get fiery red with anger. He becomes so angry, he charges after Sugriva, jumps on him and starts beating him. Now... Bali assumed that Sugriva was thinking, well, you know, you know, my brother's dead, now I can be the king. So Bali was thinking, well, you know, 
the whole thing, he blocked the whole. He used that as an opportunity so he could take the throne. But which wasn't the case. Both of them misunderstood each other. And all of a sudden, that loving relationship, they were so close, they did everything together. So much friendship, so much camaraderie. Now, it changed. And ba Bali is so angry, he's beating Sugriva. And Sugriva is no match for Bali, so he runs. And Bali's chasing him. And he's thinking, I have to run for my life. And then he, then he remembers there's one ashram called Matanga Muni's ashram. Many years ago, when Bali was fighting with one demon, he killed the demon, and he threw the body of the demon in Matanga Muni's ashram, and it landed right on his sacrificial fire and destroyed the whole fire. Matanga Muni was so angry with that, and he cursed Bali, saying that if he comes within four miles of my ashram, he'll die. So Sugriva remembered that, and then he thought, okay, here's a, here's a place I could hide out. So he ran and he got into Matanga Muni's ashram and Bali couldn't go in there because he knew the curse that if he went there he would also, he would, be, he, would, he would die by the power of that Brahminical curse. Brahmins could curse in those days if they cursed you to die. That's it. <laughs> and so now he's there. And Bali goes back and he's now, Bali is angry at Sugriva, so in order to, to get more vengeance, he captures Sugriva's wife. Her name was um, Rum Ruma, Rumi, Rumi, yeah, Rumi. He has her wife already, her name is Tara, and he, now he takes his second wife, Sugri, his brother's wife, which was a great offense. One of the greatest offenses that one can, can do is to steal another person's wife. Even if, the, even if the lady is willing, still don't do it. It's a great offense and it destroys everything. I've seen it happen even in ISKCON, so be careful. <laughs> I don't think anybody here would do it, but anyway, sometimes we think about that, right? <laughs> Boy, that lady looks nice, but she belongs to that guy. Ooh, that guy's a rascal. She would be better with me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we might think that's 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 how Bali, but Bali didn't care. So now he ruled the throne, and uh, he stole Ruma, and Sugriva is there. So in this, then we go back. Now Ram appears. And Ram, he meets Sugriva, and then he tells him his situation. My wife's would all also been stolen <laughs> by this Rakshasha, Ravana. Of course, he didn't know who it was at the time. So he makes an agreement with Sugriva to help find his wife. But Sugriva says, well, I also have this problem. My wife's also been stolen. And I am no longer in power. You know, Bali has taken the throne back. So, um, Ram said, well, what should we do? He said, well, I, we have to, I can't do anything as long, as long as Bali is trying to, you know, kill me. <laughs> so, the Ram said, all right, well, why don't you challenge him to a fight? And I'll hide behind this tree with my arrow. And when you're fighting, after some time, I'll shoot Bali and then... Haribo. <laughs> and so that was the agreement. You enjoying the story? It's okay? It's not so... It's not boring? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> so... Um, so, Bali, so Sugriva thought, all right. So he comes out and he starts yelling at Bali, challenging him to a fight. Bali says, oh, it's, who's called? Oh, it's Sugriva. Ah, he wants to fight. All right, good. So he comes out and leaves his wife. And there's a big fight. And they're fighting. And they look alike. They're brothers. And they're both monkeys. <laughs> and so Ram's looking. And apparently, apparently, he can't tell the difference between the two. So he doesn't know which one to shoot. 
so he doesn't shoot anybody because he didn't want to kill Sugriva. But Sugriva is taking a big beating, and then again he runs away and goes back to Matunga's ashram and to, to get safe from Bali. And then after some time he comes out and he comes back to Ram and he says, oh, you gave your promise. <laughs> he almost killed me. I'm barely alive after his beating. Uh, Ram said, I couldn't tell the difference between the two of you. <laughs> In order not to kill you, I didn't shoot anybody. So, challenge him again. And this time, you wear a red handbag, and so and put a band around your head so I know who's which one is which. So that was the program. So now he comes out after some time, and he challenges Bali again to a fight. And Bali's with his wife, uh, Tara. And then he hears the, the cries of Sugriva, and Bali's all ready to go out and fight again. Tara said, husband, don't go. <laughs> it's not going to be good. You know, the wife is the better half of the husband. Remember that. <laughs> so the women have this, this, uh, this ability to see things that men don't see. And they have this extra sense of perception. They can understand things. And especially when it comes to your wife. So she could understand it's going to be bad for, for Bali. It's not going to be good. So she tries to dissuade him from going. Doesn't listen. Goes anyway. So he comes out and the fight is there. And they're fighting and fighting and fighting. And again, Sugriva's losing the battle. But this time, Ram takes behind a tree and he shoots <laughs> his arrow. <laughs> and he hits Bali right in the chest and knocks him down. And he's almost dead, but he's not. And then Ram walks over to him. And Bali looks at Ram. He's still alive, but he's barely alive. Why did you do that? That was unfair. This is not Kshatriya code. You fought behind a tree. He said, you're a monkey. <laughs> Besides, you also broke religious principles. And that is you. In other words, if you're dealing with someone who's a cheater, you cheat. <laughs> Sometimes. So in this case, uh, he had stolen the wife of Sugriva, and that was a great offense. And that same thing happened to Ram, so he didn't spare Bali for that. And Bali is there, and Bali, he's like, he's becoming humble now, although he's, he's dying, of course, and he's, um, and then he starts to speak, and then Ram says to him, well, if you think it was unfair that I killed you, then I can, uh, I can give you back your life. I can remove the arrow and you'll be back. Well, he said no. He said it would be a, this opportunity to die at your lotus feet, such a great opportunity. I wouldn't have traded for anything. So he took shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. And Bali had this necklace on. It was a special necklace given by his father, Inder. Indra was his father. And as long as he wore that necklace, he couldn't die. He couldn't die. So then he starts to speak, and he turns to Sugriva. Sugriva, he said, I'm, I'm going to be leaving, so you take care, you rule. And you take care of my son, Angada, and my wife also. You make sure you give them everything. And he, went, and he just poured his heart out in a very humble way. And at one point, he took off that necklace. And as soon as he took it off, he gave it to Ram to give to Sugriva. And then when he, had, he left his body. So that's, Brahm gets criticized by commentators and others for 
somewhat fighting unfairly. But Brahma explained that, you know, in this case, he was an offender, so he dealt with an offender in a, in a, in a, in a different way. But what is the moral of this story? What is the main point of this story? And this is the essence of this whole thing. It's called judging without understanding. Judging without understanding. Sometimes we see that happens in the world, maybe in our own lives. We make judgments on something, either about a person, about a situation. But, we're not, but our judgment may be simply based on what we perceive. But that may not be the entire picture. Just like Bali judged Sugriva that he had planned to take over the kingdom, but that wasn't the truth. So he made his judgment without understanding the situation. <laughs> and because of that, you might say it cost him his life. <laughs> So judging without understanding, we find that it happens in life. We, sometimes someone will tell us about some person and we believe it. Even though we don't have any direct connection with the person or we know the person, but the situation becomes something available to us by someone else's words. And then we, we accept that. And then many times, because we accept it without knowing the full situation, we misunderstand or our judgments are wrong. Or the idea of judgment itself becomes a factor of mistake. Life is like that. Life is like that. Sometimes we judge other persons just by the way they look, or the way they speak, or the way they act, or the way they, or something about them that is something that maybe not is good, but still we make our value judgments. That's one of the dangers of life. And that can lead to great offenses. Just like people judge Ram, or they judge, they even judge Krishna, right? Krishna is like, he breaks all kinds of principles. And they think Krishna is, is not actually God because God wouldn't do that. So it's another form of judgment. It goes on in the world quite frequently. In fact, it's an everyday affair to judge without understanding. Just like people talk about our movement, right? But they don't know. They hear something from the outside or some news report or or something, or they make some judgment about some person in the movement that apparently something went wrong, but they don't know the situation, and I conclude. So to stay away from judgments is very difficult because that's the way the world works, you know. <laughs> but before you actually conclude on a subject matter or a situation or particularly a person, you should know the whole, all the facts before and otherwise there is a danger and that danger is it creates a mentality that is opposite of Krishna consciousness it's a it's a mentality of thinking about others or a situation in a world in a way that is not beneficial and it might be completely and usually is completely wrong <laughs> before you can actually give an opinion about a person you have to know the person you really have to know the person personally. So it's better not to judge anybody. That's a hard one, right? <laughs> better not to judge anybody. We might sometimes in a protective way, we, some, we, we make some judgment in order to avoid certain situations. That's normal. But we can't see, again, we can't see the whole picture, just like in the Bhagavatam, there's one verse in the 11th canto, it's 29th chapter, verses 1 and 2 in that chapter where it says, one should not praise another and one should not criticize another. Because both criticism and praise 
is always wrong. Or we might say incomplete. That's a better word, incomplete. But then verse number two says you can praise. <laughs> because that's what we do in Krishna consciousness. A lot of times we, we, we praise devotees and we give them all kinds of glorifications and it's way beyond their qualities. But it's good for us. <laughs> it's not good for them. <laughs> but it's good for us. <laughs> but when it comes to criticism, that's more dangerous. And therefore one should avoid. Therefore Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu makes this a very emphatic point in his preaching. He says, if you want my full mercy, and he's the Supreme Lord, if you want my full mercy, do two things. One, develop your attraction for an activity in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give us the Yuga Dharma, the chanting of the Holy Name. And that's very attractive to him also. So those who are attracted to chanting actually receive the mercy of the Lord in a very big way, besides the fact that one receives mercy simply by chanting. In other words, Lord Chaitanya is pleased. But he said, if you want my full mercy, he said, do one other thing. Don't find fault with anybody. <laughs> he called it a dosha darshi. Darshi means see. Uh, dosha means faults. A darshi means one who doesn't see the faults of others. <laughs> So, to see the faults of others just destroys one's mentality. Better, when you see a fault in another person, just look for their good qualities at the same time. You might say, in general, that people are somewhat balanced. No, maybe not balanced, but people have many good qualities, but there may also be some faults. But the faults don't really matter so much. They don't really matter. So overlook those things and look for the good qualities. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu makes that point. He says, one who criticizes my devotees, they're drinking poison. If they drink poison, they die. And those who praise and glorify the devotees, they're drinking nectar. And then that way they achieve eternal life. So this is Mahaprabhu. So it's very difficult in a general sense, to avoid this, this, but if we practice this very carefully, not finding fault with other, or not prematurely making judgments about things, we, then we find ourselves that Krishna consciousness becomes very easy and natural. Yeah, because th these other things simply cloud the mind and make the mind very much, what we say, in a very inordinate con we can't really focus on Krishna. And that's the whole, pro the whole process, is to focus your mind on Krishna. Okay, so this is one particular pastime. We'll be here for a few more days speaking other messages. There are many, many powerful and very important messages that Ramayan gives us in the life of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> Anyone would like to add anything in the form of questions, comments? Can't say criticisms because I told you not to do that. <laughs> but if you want, I don't mind. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Marcel? <laughs> Marcel is the, he's the beneficiary of everybody here because I learned one thing about Slovenia you all have questions but everyone's shy to ask I have studied this very carefully I know you have questions but you're also shy you don't ask so we have one person that it's a little bit different okay <laughs> he's now he's Shalaka Rishi Wow. He's our, our son. Our, oh, well, beautiful. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I won't forget that name. <laughs> Go ahead, Rish. <laughs>
um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I would just like to ask for some advice as um, if our mind is so conditioned that we uh, commonly find, find faults even though unjustified, how can we like move away from this tendency? How can we? How can we? Uh, how can we move away from the tendency of finding faults in others? Just look for the good qualities. That's all. Hmm. If you see if you see faults, just forget about it. And then, f well, one of the good qualities about the devotees is that he's a devotee. <laughs> That's the outstanding quality. How many people in this world, there are millions, actually have taken up devotional service? So that's, an, that's a rare quality to one who actually takes up devotional service is considered the best of all person. Although they may have some other f smaller faults, it's not so important. Bhakti Siddhantas gives a very powerful statement. He says, if the faults of others disturb you, look inside yourself and see what about yourself is causing you to become disturbed. Interesting. Yeah. So we can be disturbed or we can somehow or other just let it go and just go on with our Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mataji, Hare Krishna. How are you? Um, after the bus. Good. Now I'm thinking, taking my question into account for the last enlightened, you know. Um, how does this work on a practical level? If we have to deal with somebody, it's very handy to know what their bad qualities are. Like Srila Prabhupada said, I think, he said, if you're inviting a thief, you just hide the jewelry and then invite that person. <laughs> so from that point of view, it's kind of nice to know, okay, that guy tells me, He's coming to help. He'll probably, you know, be late or whatever. So how probably the trick is to know but not to judge, but like take into account but not think it's a bad thing, or how does it work practically? Mm. Well, if you see that there is some difficulty by accepting a certain type of association, then uh, one, you could avoid that if it's possible. Avoid the association. The person or the situation where the problem arises? Um, well, the situation may not be avoidable, but the person can be. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to avoid the person than the situation. Um, I think uh, it's keeping things you might have to be a little proactive in keeping things on the right track so things don't gravitate down to something that is unpleasant. Just like sometimes when someone is speaking badly, you just change the subject and speak nicely. Like what, what really f gets a person who is speaking badly, you start speaking good about the same thing he's speaking bad. And he gets all confused. <laughs> He <laughs> doesn't know what to do. <laughs> That's one way. Or if you can get away from the situation by excusing yourself from for some emergency reason, that would be good. Because you shouldn't allow people to cause you difficulty. That's an offense to yourself. If you know a situation is going to be difficult, if you can work it out and somehow or other perceive ahead of time that there's, it's, it's worth going through to see if we can come to some, you know, successful or practical or agreeable solution, then do for it, go it. But if you think the person's impossible, then just avoid it. Because I know I can, there's certain people I can talk to, and although we disagree, we can actually come to some kind of friendly conclusion even though we still disagree and there's others it's impossible so don't, I don't even bother you know <laughs> just, a, just a waste of time <laughs> because you know there are people who are argumentative 
So a little perception beforehand, knowing a little bit of the history of the person, like that. Another, you can't give a, what we say, it's like, this is the way you do it. And you have to really s understand the situation and what's there before you actually decide to act or not, a, not to act. But always keep things positive. Even if you have to say something that is uh, opposed to the person's ideas or agreements, you know, avoid anger. Because as soon as anger comes in, it kind of spoils the whole communication. People pick up on the anger rather than the words. <laughs> so then that's what we should avoid. Does that help a little? It does, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, Madhiji. Hare Krishna. Uh, there is another question that often comes up regarding the <clears throat> things that uh, Lord Ramachandra supposedly did not do right. Uh, so this is a question regarding his dealings with Mother Sita. Mm -hmm. uh, he's sending away Mother Sita. Uh, so <clears throat> the question is, it's, um, as a leader, it, it, it was ideal that he sent her away so that he would be without suspicion. But how, how did he act ideally Ideally, as a husband, by sending her away. How did he protect her as a husband by this act? You know, that's, it took me years, but I finally found out the real reason why he did it. <laughs> Which has nothing to do with husband. <laughs> it's about two demons that he tried to, he destroyed these two demons by, by sending her away. That's a whole other story. I can speak about that story when, in my next class. It's really interesting. Because that's, I mean, I've been really challenged, and so many other speakers also have been challenged. It, it seems like, but he, and Sita and Ram can never be separated. <laughs> Although there's an apparent separation, that was done in order, I'll, try to give you a little history of the demons. There was two demons. They were called, what was the name of those demons? I can't remember. But they performed austerities and they got the uh, darshan of Brahma to get a benediction. And they wanted Brahma's benediction that they could get liberation and still act as demons. And they said, the only way we can uh, not get our liberation is that if Sita and Ram are separated. Because they knew that the Lord can never be separated from his internal energy. So the Lord knew that, so he frustrated these two demons by separating her, and then their, their uh, plan to get liberation and still act as demons was destroyed. Because Brahma gave him that benediction. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the hidden story, but there's much more to it. So that was that's the under uh, the reason why he did it. But in another sense, although they were separated physically, they were never separated. They were always together in spirit. That was the that's how it's understood anyway. Because the Lord cannot be separated from his internal energy. But there's an apparent separation that looks like separation, but it's just there for Leela, that's all. <laughs> for, like that. Does that help a little? Yes. I'll tell, I'll tell the whole story in another class. I have, I'm giving class tomorrow night and Tuesday night and also on Wednesday. Because so. that's an interesting story. And uh, it needs to be told, too, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that one. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay.
on time. Yeah. Oh, another question? Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Am I going o over time? A little over time, okay. It's okay. No, you continue. It's in the Shastra. Mad Madhvacharya actually talks about this. Then I must accept it. But then the one that I heard that made sense kind of satisfied the, you know, the feelings. And which I heard from one Swami, but I cannot base it on any Shastra. So maybe you know the basis, or maybe you will say this both. He said that Lord Ram did it to show that, it, that it's wrong to do so. <laughs> that, that uh, if Krishna was asked to forsake his mother, or if Nanda Maharaj would be told, you know, you know, forsake Krishna, he would just say, get out of here. No Why would he do something negative to teach from that point of view? It doesn't make sense. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm not even giving the name of this Swami because I don't remember what he based this answer on. Well, people are looking for some answers because no one has been able to satisfy. I found this one from one devotee who studies the Ramayana. I mean, he really studied it and he found this and it's statements by Madhvacharya so it's coming from that source. So, it's sort of perfect, like it makes perfect sense, but still, as a husband, how did he protect her as a husband? I also don't... Well, he's under the Valmiki's ashram and then of course, what happened later when she was in Valmiki's ashram, she gave birth to two children, Kush and Love. And then later, they, they started to glorify their father, not knowing who their father was. <laughs> so, and, the, and of course, that was a way to bring, to bring her back to the spiritual world. It was, it was accordingly, what they say it was time for her to leave. So, yeah. But I don't I don't agree with that other statement. This doesn't make sense why he would do something wrong to teach from that pos pos position. <laughs> if he's going to teach from that position and do something wrong, he'll say this is wrong, don't do it. But that wasn't said. <laughs> Because he ha he'd have to clarify that that's why he did it, but there's no statement like that. Mm. Okay, we'll stop here. I think there's uh, some other program that's going on. Oh, was there some awards, some certificates or something? That was all done already? Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. and. Prepare yourself and read up about Ram's pastimes. They're really quite instructive and interesting. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Chandra Maoli Maharaj Ki Jai.